SoundCloud, where he is personally responsible for uh, recommendations. In fact, uh, he gives recommendations. Like whenever you see a recommendation on SoundCloud, it is him typing that in. <laughs> yes, and um, today uh, he's going to talk about type class induction, and uh, type classes are a really common theme in Scala, and in particular type class induction is a very common theme in Shapeless in particular. So uh, I think you're going to demystif demystify us today. Uh, okay, well then, uh, please welcome Aaron. I'm going to be yelling a lot, so just with the sound people back there. Um, so, uh, as Lars so kindly uh, stated, my name is Aaron Levin. Um, if you can follow the emoji-driven narrative up there, I work, I manage a team of data scientists at SoundCloud, and we work in the uh, domains of search uh, and recommendations, and also the overall listening experience. And I'm super excited to be here today in Denmark. It's my first time in Denmark, and I'm learning all kinds of wonderful things about this amazing country. And I'm extra super excited to be here at the Type Global Summit because I think, I feel these uh, kind of community events are so important and one of the most exciting parts of the Scala um, ecosystem. So super excited to be here. Also, SoundCloud is sponsoring the um, Type Class, or the, the Type Class Summit, the, <laughs> <laughs> uh, the Type Global Summit. And um, we're doing this because we hire a lot of Scala developers we're located in Berlin. If you're interested in working with us, uh, please come and talk to me. Um, there, enough uh, corporate spiel. Let's get into the real meat of the problem. So I want to talk about um, type class induction, and that's there's a lot of things to unpack in there. Type classes, induction, joining the two. Um, so I want to kind of motivate going through this by talking about a problem I encountered at work. Um, uh, so SoundCloud, it's a MP3 upload website, and um, Many people are uploading their MP3s, and then people are listening to them. And what happens when you have an MP3 upload website, people are listening to things, is you want to understand what they're doing so you can make it a little bit better. And inevitably, some person is listening to some amazing music and generating all kinds of events. And if anybody here has um, you know, a system where they're keeping track of all this data, inevitably you end up with some enormous event sync that's taking in all these events and then trying to figure out how to parse them and validate them so that you can eventually, you know, based on the previous talk, put them in the data lake and, uh, <laughs> and then do your uh, map reduce and these things. A lot of information can be gleaned from the poo that swells in the data lake, data, data lake but it's got to get there first. And so when I joined SoundCloud, you know, I, I came into this code base, I kind of had this gnarly dynamic dispatching where they had this sealed trait hierarchy of events, you know, click, play, pause, there was many more events, and then, you know, there was some weird thing parsing them, um, and there was like this just nasty, um, you know, kick, basically like a switch statement here that was saying like, if you've got, you know, if you've got a click, parse it as a click. If you've got a play, parse it as a play. If you've got a pause, parse it as a pause. And I remember trying to work with this um, system, of course it didn't look exactly like this, but you know, th that was the, the, the spirit of it. Um, working with this, it was like really cumbersome. I, you know, I'd have to, every time I up added a new event, I had to put it into this hierarchy and then I'd update all this matching code. And I just felt like this was gross. And then I got this weird idea in my mind, um, maybe not a good idea, but I was like, maybe we can figure out some way of like deriving all this using the magic of implicit resolution. Um, and if you ever think, maybe I can do this with the magic of implicit resolution, like maybe like take a step back for a while. But if you do do it, you'll come out with some great learnings. And um, eventually, I was able to you know, do something like this, where I had some weird type class, and we'll go into its definition and all that, and then I was able to just dispatch and get my result that I wanted. And so at the end of this talk, I want you to feel and to understand exactly all the you know, banana stuff that's going on in here to actually do this. And my goal is not that you'll go out there and inductively define all your type classes and remove all possible boilerplates of the world, but that you'll understand how implicit resolution works and how it's used in the Scala ecosystem in libraries like Shapeless or Circe. <coughs> so that's, that's the goal. And we're going to get there by doing the following things. First, we're going to talk about induction. 
and then we're going to talk about type classes, and then we're going to do, you know, baby's first type class induction, and then we're going to kind of shift the gears of abstraction a little bit, and hopefully you can hold on to your seats, because at the end of it, you'll all become magicians. Um, and so, without much further ado, let's talk about induction. So, just to get uh, rid of the room, who here has ever inductively proved something? Oh, all the heads. Okay, good. So, we're gonna, you're all going to be super bored for the next 10 minutes, but that's good. Um, because boredom uh, results in creativity. And um, we... we uh, so yeah, so let's talk about it. So, anyways, let's talk, let's talk about induction. So, um, to talk about induction, we're going to talk about dominoes. Um, I don't want to give a proof or formal definition of induction because all the real logicians will just get mad at me. Um, but I think what we want is to take the spirit of induction, or as we say in German, the Gestalt of induction, and use that in our day-to-day -day programming. And I think the best way to communicate this is with Domino's, and not the Domino's pizza that's so beautifully in this gift, but actually the Domino's that just fall over each other. And I'm always uh, bemused by Domino's because there is some actual game people play with this, but mostly we just deal with them knocking each other over. Um, and the game involves none of the knocking each other over. Um, so, to, to, dis discuss, um, <laughs> to discuss Domino's, or to discuss induction, we're going to prove that all the dominoes will fall. We're going to prove this using induction. And all inductive proofs have generally two steps. They have what's called a base case, where you prove uh, your hypothesis for a single element, and then you have an induction step, where you assume your hypothesis is true for some arbitrary element and show that it's true maybe for the next one. Um, and so if we want to prove that all the dominoes will fall, the base case proof is that we're going to knock over the first domino. So you can prove this just by knocking something over that I want. <coughs> so the base case is the first domino will fall by pushing it. Then for our inductive step, we need, to, we need to show the following, that if any domino falls, so if we assume a domino falls, we need to prove that the next domino will fall. And we do this just by going to our dominoes and we can just measure the distances between them and we, they're all the right distance so that if any one of them falls, the next one will fall. And if we prove both of these things, if we prove that the first one will fall, and then assuming one will fall, that the next one will fall, then they all must fall. Because the first one will fall, and then we have the inductive step that says, like, well, if one of them falls, the next one will fall. So the first one fails, and then the second one fell, and then the second one fails, and the third one fell, and the third one fell, and the fourth one fell, all the way until the end of your dominoes. And you really need both these steps. If you don't have the base case, but you prove the inductive step, then you might align all your dominoes up so they're really close to each other, but you haven't knocked any of them down, so they're just going to sit there. And if you have the base case, but not the induction step, you're going to knock one of them over, but it might not knock any of the other ones over, so not all the dominoes will fall. So that's the gestalt of uh, induction, and you know, I'll show you how we use this in math. Um, here's a really useful theorem in your day-to-day -day life. Um, you can prove <coughs> that n factorial is greater than or equal to 2 to the n, for n greater than or equal to 4. Does anyone disagree with this statement? I mean, you could. Um, I didn't disagree with it either. So we start with a base case. So in the base case, we assume that we show that p of 4 is true. So how do you show this? Well, just calculate it. 4 factorial is some number I can't calculate in my brain. 2 to the n is some 2 to the 4 some other number. And if you show that one is bigger than the other, it's true. Okay? And then our inductive step is Assume this magical theorem holds for p of n. Now let's prove that it's true for p of n plus 1. And I don't want to do that here, but you can do it. Just take some algebra. And if you do both of these things, you can conclude that p of n is true for all n greater than or equal to 4. So that's like what an inductive proof might look like in mathematics. Again, the real mathematicians and logicians of the world are probably having a heart attack right now, but that's the good Um In programming, though, it kind of looks a little different. You know, putting aside this whole proofs or programs business. We're not really like proving too many things, or maybe we want to be proving more things. But induction still kind of comes up in the way we define data structures and, and write some algorithms. So for example, um, you can calculate the length of a, of a list in a sort of like induction-based manner. Um, you might have a function called length. It takes a list in and returns an integer. You define this by pattern matching on the list. And here's where you start doing your induction. You have a base case, nil. And here you say that the length of the nil list is zero. And then you have an inductive step, where you assume that you can calculate the length of the tail of the list. 
And if that's true, show that you can calculate the length of the head cons with the tail, merely by adding one to it. So here's your base case, the length of the list of nil is zero, and here's your inductive step. I assume this is possible, and I can calculate the length of this by adding one to that result. And if you do this, you will certainly calculate the length of the list. Maybe not the way it's done in the standard library, and probably not the way you should do it because of reasons, but this is nonetheless an inductive way to define lit, the length. Similarly with map, so you can map over list. We all love the function map. It takes a list of A's and a, bunch of fun and a function from A to B, it returns a list of B's, and your inductive uh, definition of map would pattern match on list, you have your base case mapping over nil, just returns nil, and in the induction step, you assume that you can map over the tail, so we assume that this returns. We can map over the head cons of the tail just by applying <coughs> the function of the head and consing over it with whatever that returns. And note that you need both of these things to be true. So if we don't have the base case, if we just have the induction step, it's possible that this would just never return or fail. So that's bad. If we have only this but not this, then you're only able to calculate the length of the, or the, you're only able to map over the empty list. So that's kind of induction in, in, a, in a nutshell. You have a base case and then an inductive step. And we're able to do this on lists because lists have this sort of inductive structure where they have a, like a base element and then every uh, 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 object of list has like this, you know, sort of inductive definition. And so I mentioned to do type class induction, then we're going to talk a little bit about induction, and then we're going to talk about type classes, and then we're going to talk about type class induction. So we've, you know, graduated from the induction kindergarten, and we're entering grade one of type classes. <coughs> and when I started preparing for this talk, I was like, okay, uh, we're going to talk about type classes, maybe I should define type classes. So who here thinks that there's like an actual definition you can look up in a book of what a type class is? <laughs> I, I certainly did, and maybe some people are going to correct me wrong, but I went to the source, you know, I like, did my functional programming archaeology and looked up Philip Wadler's papers that he's published and went to 1989, you know, introducing type classes for the Haskell programming language. And I searched that whole paper for definition. A type class is this, and it came up short. And as I did a little bit more digging, I, it was really hard to find, like, somebody just say, like, this is what a type class is. So I'm going to give you, like, my definition of a type class, um, and uh, just so you have something to hold in your mind. But, you know, bear in mind it's probably not the formal definition. Maybe it's the gestalt of type classes. Um, and it is as follows. Um, a type class associates functionality with a type. So, for example, if we have a type class foo here, implemented as a trait in Scala, what we're trying to say here is an instance of this trait sort of associates A with the functionality of foo. And what's nice is that in Scala, we can rely on implicit resolution to find and use these type class instances. And this is why they're so powerful and handy. Because we can write functions like bar here, where we say A is some type, I don't know what it is, some type, but I expect <coughs> that it has the functionality described in foo for, that, for whatever that type of A is. So to give a more concrete example of a type class, let's talk about a class called Squishy that I just made up today. Um, squishy has a method called squish that takes two A's and returns an A. Now, some of you might be saying, isn't that a semi-group? And for that, I'll say, well, who likes semi-group? Squishy things are way more fun. Um, <laughs> so we're going to talk about squishy things. And you might use this type class in a function called like self-squish, which is um, it's kind of like what we all want when we're sad, you know? We just want to be helped. Um, so self-squish. Uh, this is like what, a, what happens when a functional programmer tries to do object oriented programming. Uh, anyways, um, a, a self switch is parameterized by A and it takes an A element. But we, we demand that there is uh, an instance of squishy for A, and then we can use it right here by just squishing the A's together. So that's the self squish. So don't you think that type classes are powerful? I mean, how would you, how would you do this in the object oriented programming? Uh, and, but what's really cool about type classes is that implicit resolution, because they're kind of magical. So I'm going to put this squishy trait up here again to remind you. Now, what's cool is that suppose I write my function in self-squish, but instead of having an A, I have like an option of A. 
I don't want to have to like write a squishy instance for integer and then write a squishy instance for option of integer. When in my mind, I think I have a way to automatically generate. Like I know that if, if I can squish A's, and I should be able to squish options of A's in some way. And using the power and magic of implicit resolution, you can do this. So you can write an implicit method um, uh, right here that requires an implicit squishy A to produce a squishy of option A. Um, and basically what we're saying to Scala is that if we have a squishy A, then you can always create a squishy of option A. And we do that by defining squish in this method here, and we just pull the A's out of the options and then squish them together, and indeed we're actually using the fact that A's are squishy to define the squishy of option A. And I don't know how you would do this in uh, normal uh, object or into programming, not because this is necessarily too powerful, I literally just do not know, but um, my hunch is that this would be very challenging to do without something like a type class and it puts a resolution. And so when you're armed with this kind of power, where the compiler can generate these instances for you, it begs the question, can we do more interesting things with this? And at one starry night, I was looking at the sky and wondering, can we leverage implicit resolution to do type class induction? And that's what I hope to convince you today. So we talked about induction, we talked about type classes, we've now entered the realm of type class induction. And to discuss this, what we're gonna do is we're gonna define something called a type level list. In the same way that when we defined our function of length <coughs> of lists, we had to have some kind of inductive structure to do this, we're gonna need some kind of like inductive structure type and that will be our type level list. So we're gonna define what those look like. We're not gonna use the shapeless um, type level list, but just to make it simpler to have this discussion, we're gonna use tuples, because who doesn't like a tuple? Um, then we're gonna define a type class, just to illustrate an example, it's gonna be called name. This is a really simple type class, it just associates with each type a string name for it. And then we're gonna derive a named instance for any type level list. And we're going to do that by starting with a base case, by showing that there's a named instance for EOL, you'll hear about this in a second, and by doing an inductive step, where we say, if you have a named instance for the head and a named instance for the tail, you can produce a named instance for the tuple of head and tail. And then we're going to really take this to the next level, and I hope you can all stay with me in this. So this is our little roadmap. Let's talk about type level lists. So if we're going to define some kind of list, list structure of the type, we need to first come up with a type level nil. So to do this, we're just gonna define EOL, which is end of list as a type, and we're just gonna set it equal to unit. You just need to set this to some type, one that's hopefully not to use, and preferably I'd like to use nothing, but for type inferences problem, it's easier to use unit. Um, and there we go. And the next thing we need for any list structure is some kind of like consing mechanism, where you have a head and a tail, a head of the tail. And to do this, we're going to use tuples. So you can imagine this type level list, whatever that means, represented in our tuple format as, an, as a tuple of integer and then some tuple structure. And so you have this nice head and tail structure where the head of your type level list is a type here and then the tail is also some kind of tuple structure until it reaches the end of the list. And this can be, you can make this arbitrary as, as many times as you want, you can keep going until you reach EOL. It's a very flexible uh, format. And we can do induction on it because we have a base case right here and we'll have an induction step right here. <coughs> so with our type level lists defined, we can now take a look <coughs> at this nice uh, type class that we described earlier called name um, and just show you what that's all about. So, uh, our name type class is a, a type class that associates with each type E here a name string. So here are some example instances. We have a named integer, it just holds the string int. A name char holds the string char. A name string holds the, same, the string or the name str. Mainly just so I can fit it on the line. Um, <laughs> so pretty straightforward, right? They're just implicit instances of this uh, really stripped down type class. And certainly if we, and I'm going to leave this up here all the time so you don't have to remember it, um, if we go to the compiler 
or so if we go to the console, which is sort of like the altar of the gods of the compiler, um, and we ask uh, for an instance of name char, it will conjure it and produce the following result of char. So I think hopefully this should be straightforward. This is just raw implicit resolution happening in the compiler. So now, armed with a type level list, and armed with our type class, now we can do type class induction, as I promised. So our goal is to take this name uh, type class and create an instance of it for any type level list. So specifically, what we want to be able to do is you know, approach the altar of the Scala gods, ask them to conjure an instance of name for int, char, string, end of list, and they call the name on it, and we <coughs> expect to get out of this Something that looks like this, int, char, and string. Okay? And we want this to happen all at compile time. And we, what we don't want to do is just implement it straightforward. I mean, that's, we could do that. We could just say implicit val equals new name for that instance and type it out. But we want Scala to derive this. We want to do it using induction. So to do induction, we start with the base case. In the case of type class induction, the base case is going to be the um, end of list element for your type level list. And the base uh, implementation for our name type class is just going to have the name empty string. So this is our base, our base case. Okay? Next, we're going to go to the inductive step. And this is where things are going to get a little bit uh, more interesting. We have our name type class on top there to remind you all. And here, we're going to define an implicit method. This implicit method takes requires two implicit definitions, a named head and a named tail. And if you have a named head and a named tail, it'll produce a named <coughs> head, tail, tuple. And it does this by just writing the name of the head, comma, the tail. Okay? And now I claim that we are done. But before we go to the next slide, I'll just remind you what this implicit method is doing is it saying if you have a named head and if you have a named tail, you can produce a named tuple of head and tail. And if we took this to the altar and asked the gods to conjure us the instance of name for int, char, string, and eol, and called dot name, we would see that we get something slightly different than what we predicted. But nonetheless, we get a string here with a beautiful trailing comma. <laughs> so, and not only do we get this, uh, we wrote no instance for this, but if I then go back and give it some horrendous other type of int char string int char char end of list, we're going to get int char string int char 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 trailing comma. Um, you can get rid of the trailing comma, but it just makes the code ugly. Um, so, how is this all working? Because if you were like me when I first saw this kind of stuff, I was kind of like, this doesn't make any sense. Like, this must be there must be macros here. You know, like there must be macros. Um, but actually, there's not macros. <laughs> and there's not horrible skeletons in there either. It's doing exactly what our base and inductive step are telling it to do. So let's dig into this a little bit deeper. So when we call here named of char string and list, what happens is that Scala will start looking for an instance of named int char string, UL. And it will say, I don't, I don't have one. I don't have an exact instance for this in scope. But I do have an int, a, a named int. And <laughs> I have this wonderful implicit definition that says if I have a named head and a named tail, I can produce a name for the tuple of head and tail. And so it'll say, hey, do I have a named tail? Do I have a named char string UL? And it'll say, like, mm, I don't have exactly this, but I do have a named char. And I have this beautiful implicit definition that says if you have a named head and a named tail, you can produce a named tuple of head and tail. And so it says, okay, I have the named char, but do I have this named string UL? So it goes and looks for it. And it says, I don't have an instance for name, string, or EOL, but I do have an instance for string and an instance of our base case of EOL, and I have that wonderful implicit definition that says if I have an instance for head and an instance for tail, I can produce an instance for the tuple of head and tail, and it, it finds those instances and then resolves all the way back up. And that is why when we put this at the, at the altar here, we get in char string. So what have we done? We defined, yeah, well, it's a good question. What have we done? We, <laughs> we have defined a type level list. And then we defined a type class called name, which associates with each type a string. And we derived a named instance for any type level list. 
by starting with a base case for name DOL and doing an induction step where we had an implicit a method that said if you have a name for the head and a name for the tail, you can produce a name for the tuple of head and tail. And specifically, we then showed at the altar by asking Scala to produce the uh, implicit uh, instance and then it gave sort of almost the right answer. So with that being said, I think we're ready to kind of shift the gears of abstraction and show you how we solved the heterogeneous event sync problem by using type class induction <coughs> in five minutes. Um, <laughs> so remember we had this kind of like dynamic dispatch where we had you know, some event called click and we needed to parse it as a click. And then if that worked or it didn't, it didn't match, we go to the next one, et cetera, et cetera. So to solve this with type class induction, we're going to create a new type class called dynamic dispatch. It has a path type called L, which is going to be the result of your dispatch. And it has a method called dispatch that takes a name, which is the string, which is going to be the name of the event, and a message, which is going to be the payload we parse, and returns an option of out. And again, you should probably return either here, but an option fit on my slides better. Um, and then we're also going to assume there's some kind of parser available as well, that we can parse our types. But this is more just an implementation detail. So, to define our dynamic dispatch type class, we're going to start, inductively, we're going to start with the base case. And the idea here is that we're going to have a type level list of the bespoke events that we're allowed to parse in our event sync. And then we're going to use that type level list of events to derive something that can do the dynamic dispatcher. So for our base case, we just have an instance of dynamic dispatch for EOL, where the output type is nothing and the dispatch just returns nothing. And the reason for this is that the idea is that at, at this point, we've checked that the name for every single event we have in our list and nothing is matching, so we're at the bottom, so we cannot return anything, we just return none. And if you think about this problem a little bit deeper, this is basically the only implementation of this that makes sense. So that's our base case for the dynamic dispatch. For the inductive step, it's gonna get a little bit zanier. So we're gonna have another implicit method and in this one, we're going to assume that our head is named and that we have a parser for the head. And then here's our inductive step. Our inductive step says we assume that the tail can be dynamically dispatched. And if all these three things hold, then we can produce a dynamic dispatcher for the tuple of head and tail, just like we did with the name instances. And so we start, the first thing we have to do is decide what our output is. And this is really tricky because the idea here is we have this type level list of events. And we're somewhere in, in, in this list. But we don't know how many more types are left. So what is the type that we're going to actually return at the end of this depends on what the type of the return of our tail is. And this is probably like way, if, if it's not making sense now, it's probably not going to make sense until you really sit with it because it's really tricky. And so if this is a bit confusing, like that's OK. You can read the code after this, and, and maybe that'll make a little bit more sense. But this is super powerful because this is actually a, a value and we're pulling a type out of that and creating this output type like dynamically at compile time. And then we'll have our dispatch method which will take a name of the string and a message and return an option out. And specifically it's gotta return whatever this thing is. So we'll take a look at what that looks like. So let's give in line the full definition here. We have our implicit method and we have our output type and here's what our um, dispatch method looks like. It takes a name and a message. And the first thing we do is we ask, does the name equal the head of the name? So this is to say, if I'm at the pause type, is the name of this um, thing that's coming in the pipeline, pause. And if it is, we're going to try to parse it. Parse returns an option. But note that the output type of dispatch is out here. And in this instance, we're, we are parsing this as head. So we need to take the result of this and wrap it in a write because the, um, the output here must be either tail instance out or head. In this case, it's head, so it gets wrapped in a right. If it's not equal to head, then what we have to do is use the tail instance to dispatch on the name of the message, and it will return some result. But then we have to return our option out here, and we're going to return whatever type this is, so we wrap it up in a left. So this is pretty hairy stuff, probably to take in like a talk in five minutes. But if I go back to the altar and ask Scala to conjure up an instance, and suppose I've got names for all these and parcels for all these, and then I say, okay, dispatch on int and 10, 
It'll return sum right to 10. Because remember, the output was uh, the output of dispatch was option and then this either type. But what's interesting is that int is the first element here. If I then try to dispatch on char, it'll return sum left, right, b. Furthermore, if I try to dispatch on string, it'll return sum left, left, right, whatever. So this thing is actually, this output type here is captured with the proper output type of our type level list here. Because string is the third type. And so if you remember this horrible uh, looking either type here, if string is the third type, it's going to be nested three times. <coughs> so also, if we put whatever we want in here, we're just going to get none. So that's our dynamic dispatch. And this all works, and this is all done at compile time. But there's so much more. So for example, at the beginning, I told you that some of this is used in the Scala ecosystem. And again, this is just the gestalt of it. This is like you know kindergarten of, uh, of, of type class deduction, or, or, or Kita if you're in Germany. Um, you can imagine that if you have some kind of like case class, like a click that has a string, a string, a long in it, maybe there's some process using macros that can produce a type level list with string, string, long. And then if you're able to inductively use type class induction to define a parser for such an object using the methods we described, then you have a way of you know, generically deriving instances of the type class in your library. You really want to take this to another level um, you can imagine that you describe maybe your web API of the type, and you interpret that thing using type class induction to produce a server um, for your API. And such, such things are, are, are <coughs> totally possible using this technique. So in closing, type class induction, to do this, you need type level lists, you need really cool type classes, you need a base case uh, instance, and you need an induction step and then now you're all a logician. And I hope that's been five minutes. Thank you very much. If nobody has questions, I'll just tell you questions you should be asking. <laughs> so some questions you should be asking is like, what is the performance cost of this? So you might ask, like, why can't I just, we've seen a lot of macros today. Why can't I just do, why can't I just use a macro for this? Why would I do this type class induction? And you're right that the macros could produce more efficient code than our skeleton friend over here. Um, but as I kind of said at the beginning, you know, it's not necessary that you actually want to always use this technique. I think this technique is really useful for certain situations. But if you understand this technique, I guarantee that you will understand every instance of implicit resolution in every single Scala code base. Because at the heart, that's bold. I'm making a bold claim that nobody can hold me accountable for, so. <laughs> uh, and so, yeah, there is performance overhead. So, for example, in our dispatch, if you're going to have one object allocation, it will be static, so it will happen just once, but you'll have one method in direction um, at each step, which is probably less efficient than a switch statement, but if you're, like, trying to optimize at that level of things, um, probably don't need to. What I can say is we did this on, like, 17 events in a MapReduce pipeline that processed 2 billion events an hour, and there was no dis discernible overhead in switching to user. Right that or or compact that. It does it at the top time. So at doing this type class induction on, on such a thing had no uh, perceivable impact on a MapReduce drop. Now that's because MapReduce drops are often limited by network, so um, like all the So now that you've heard me rant, does anyone have questions? This one. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I'll try and make a good one. Um, did you have to mess around at all with uh, prioritization of the implicits, or were there any other gotchas around ordering? Um, not like with something as simple as this, no. Um, but in, in the, the real world implementation, there was like weird subtyping stuff, and there was a little bit of gotchas, but uh, I would say like not as many as you might think by doing this. Like this was this. You know, basic just induction step on the type of a list structure, I think was relatively straightforward for the Scala compiler to figure out. The problems I ran into were mostly that the error messages that it produces are completely unhelpful. So, like, it would be like, instance missing. And you'd be like, whoa, did I have a parser for the head? Is that what's missing?
missing? Did I have a name for my head? Was it the tail instance was missing? And like that aspect of it was really awful. Um, yeah. Okay, thanks everyone. If you want to ask more questions, feel free to come.